Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for District 17, Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's edition of Kibitzing with Kagan. With me today is my very special guest, the new House Majority Leader, Delegate Mark Foreman. Delegate Corman, thank you so much for taking time to chat today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yay. Well, this feels like, um, you know, I don't know. I, I have a million questions to ask you. Uh, so let's start, though, with the fact that you grew up in Rockville and graduated from Richard Montgomery High School in the heart of District 17. Uh, talk about your childhood, if you would. Uh, well, obviously, I grew up in the second best legislative district uh, in the state of Maryland. <laughs> district 16 is, of course, uh, the best. But no, I was uh, I was born in 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 Pot Rock, I guess, uh, first near Churchill and then near uh, Richard Montgomery, born and raised there. And uh, my parents still have a house in your district, uh, though they're in the process of uh, of transitioning to their uh, to their retirement. So you'll be losing a couple of constituents in the not too distant future. Uh, but um, but yeah, no, I, I grew up in the area and uh, went away for a while for school, but then came back. And uh, it's uh, it's different. You know, my parents uh, grew up in New York, so kind of nowhere near where, where I grew up. Uh, but with my kids, they're constantly going to the places that you know I, I went to as a kid. We're constantly. It's a different Richard Montgomery now, but we drive by there all the time. And I was yep. that I went to school there or Julius yep. Rashford Bell. Yep. So, yep. Well, you've started covering a lot of the things that I want to get to. I have lots of questions for you. So let's talk about your time in California. So you went out uh, to USC and uh, you were there when the Supreme Court ruled on Bush v. Gore, the Supreme Court decision that basically handed the White House to uh, George W. Bush. Uh, you also worked for uh, Governor Gray Davis and stuff. Talk about what was formative for you about California. Yeah, so I better specify that USC is the University of Southern California, not the University of South Carolina, which uh, at least uh, when I was first going out to high school or to college in the in the late '90s, a lot of people in our area thought I was going to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, so you always got to watch those acronyms. Fair but, um, yeah, I mean, I went out there thinking I was gonna um, um, uh, echo. Have you seen the Fablemans, the Steven Spielberg story? I have kind just saw last week. Yeah, that was kind of what I wanted to do, uh, and uh, and uh, you know, was always interested in politics and government, but it wasn't my calling. Uh, and then, as you said, the, the, the 2000 election took place and I just started getting much more involved uh, after that. Actually, um, the story I tell, which is true, is I marched into a USC Democrats meeting after um, uh, the Supreme Court did what they did and said, how could you all let this happen? Not acknowledging that, you know, California's 52 or 55 electoral votes easily went for Al Gore. Right. And, uh, a guy in there who's still my friend, actually his brother's now in the Massachusetts legislature, uh, said, what are you talking about? How could we let this happen? I haven't seen you at any meetings before. And uh, I never really wanted to feel that way again. And so yeah. I, uh, I kept going to meetings and uh, it obviously snowballed a little out of control from just going to meetings to where it is today. But that was definitely what sort of set me off on the path of political and public service. Well, we are lucky that it did because you are an extraordinary legislator and we're going to get to that. But first you detoured, you got your master's at Hopkins and then went to University of Maryland Law. Um, you had a you had a professor with a familiar name to me. Uh, I had a couple. I had Feldman? a couple. Uh, okay. Yeah, your guest last week, I think, um, uh, Senator Feldman, Chairman Feldman, excuse Chairman me. Chairman Feldman, yeah. Uh, it was my professor at Hopkins, which was a program I did actually while uh, working on Capitol Hill. It was really very conducive to, to Hill staff and other government workers. And then one of our other colleagues, uh, Delegate Rosenberg, yep. uh, was my professor at the University of Maryland uh, School of Law. So uh, I had... Uh, good training for, for my current job, for sure. Absolutely. So then you practiced law and Sidley and Austin and, and did that whole thing. Uh, and then you decided to run for the House. What made you decide to run for the House of Delegates in, in beautiful District 16? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, first of all, you know, I still practice law at Sidley Austin. That's one of the, the, the things about our legislature that most people don't understand. Unlike our council members and our federal representatives, it is it is part time. We are a citizen. I'm going to say part time. I, yeah. I always say less than full time pay, uh, less than half time pay for more than full time work. Yeah, I mean, I usually say I have two full time jobs, not including my family. So for yes. sure. Um, but, you know, a lot of the issues I cared about uh, were dealt with at the state level. I was, um, you know, as you know, very concerned about transit issues, uh, particularly the metro system, which I was- We're getting to that too. You know, <laughs> You're ahead of me on all this, on. of course. <laughs> uh, and so that was, that's a big issue that, you know, the, the state actually deals with. People don't think of it as a state issue, but in our, yeah. our state, that is where it's funded from and, and, and our share of the governance comes from. Uh, things like school construction, uh, thinking about where my kids were going to be going and the uh, capacity for them. And then a lot of environmental issues, um, which of course can be dealt with the other levels of government, but 
uh, you know, the state is a, is a great place to have an impact on those. So the things I cared about, uh, it seemed like the state uh, was a great opportunity to, to have an impact on them. And, you know, quite honestly, as you know, with, with politics, a lot of it is just timing. It yeah. just so happened that I was in sort of the right place in my life and we had an open seat uh, come up. So I threw my hat in the ring with, I think, I think there were 13 of us for three seats um, and, uh, and went for it. Wow. So that beats me. There were 10 of us when I first ran, two incumbents and then eight of us going for the third seat. So. Yeah. So now that I've said that out loud, I think it might have been less the year I actually ran. I thought about running in 2010 and I think that was the year it might have been 13 for three. Okay. I, can't, I can't quite keep track. Right, right, right. Um, so you have been ranked uh, in Maryland Matters and just are widely known as one of the most thoughtful, effective, and re respected legislators. And that is reflected so much in not just your accomplishments, but also in your positions of, um, of leadership. So let's start with what do you think makes you so effective? Give me a couple of things like tips for the freshmen. There are currently 39, I guess there'll be 40 or 41 uh, freshmen in the house. There are 10 uh, new senators. Um, what, what are some things that will help them be effective? So first of all, I don't necessarily accept the premise of the question because obviously yeah. it's nice to have those rankings and everything. But I think uh, like a lot of us, when I'm driving home at night, I think about all the things I got wrong that day and, and mistakes I made. But, um, you know, actually I was on um, Speaker Jones's subcommittee when I first got to Annapolis. She was my subcommittee chair on the Appropriations Committee. And I went to see her and asked what you just asked me. And her advice was do the reading. Yes. Um, so, um, you know, she showed me on the Appropriations Committee, we, we do these budget briefings. She showed me her highlighted, you know, budget briefing because she had read ahead of time the work. And, I, you know, that was a very specific example, but I think it applies to lots of what we do in Annapolis. You know, look at the bills. Um, don't just get up and start asking questions about something you haven't even uh, looked at or, or thought about. And, you know, similarly, do the homework on your own bills. Um, you know, a lot of people, as you know, request bills that might already be law or uh, might make sense in a different state, but don't really apply here. Um, and so I would say, you know, do the reading, do your homework, um, you know, to the extent you can, things move pretty fast around here. So yes. it's not possible to, to know everything about every bill, but you know, if you wanna be involved in an issue, you have to devote time to that issue. I don't think you can just pop up uh, and, and casually try to, you know, introduce a major piece of legislation on it or, or a floor amendment or, you know, some debating point without having done the, Done, done the legwork ahead of time. So yes. that was Speaker Jones's advice to me when she was my subcommittee chair. And I think that's a, a good one to pass on. I like it. Um, let's go back to Metro for a second. So District 17 and District 16 uh, both have the red line sort of plowing through it. How do you think Metro is going so far, you know, lately and with the new leadership, uh, biggest challenge and the, the what especially encourages you that's going better? Yeah, I mean, the biggest challenge is actually not really specific to Metro. It's it's actually all transit, which is the impact of, of COVID-19, where, you know, most transit systems in the country have just been absolutely walloped in terms of uh, ridership. And in our area, the federal government still mostly allowing remote work uh, is a big part of that story. Um, and it's just a huge challenge because, you know, Metro, uh, our Metro rail system actually used to have one of the highest fare box recovery rates in the country, the amount of revenue it got to pay for its operations from people paying fares. And now that's just not the case because ridership is, is you know, less than 50% of what it was you know, pre-pandemic. And even pre-pandemic, it was down from pre-Great Recession in our area. But those problems before the pandemic were a little bit more about you know, some of the service and safety issues. Now, you know, Metro, it's not operating perfectly, don't get me wrong, but even if it were, there's this uh, existential challenge that it and other transit systems are dealing with. We do have new, you know, relatively new leadership. Uh, the, the new general manager is Randy Clark. And um, look, I, I like the guy, you know, as a person, I really like his communications and public engagement. Um, I know a relatively small amount of Metro's ridership is actually on Twitter, but it's an active place and he's been very active on it. And he's also changed Metro's culture of dealing with Twitter. So it's not just him personally on Twitter communicating with riders, but he's also made sure that Metro's customer service is communicating that way. And he just has shown a willingness to try to innovate and do things and not kind of wait around for you know changes to come later, which I really appreciate. But I'll also say that he's at least the third, what I'll call savior general manager, mm -hmm. since I've been closely paying attention to Metro and the problems persist. So yeah. it's very hard, even someone who spends as much time uh, 
on it, both physically riding it and then paying attention to it as I do, it's just really hard to know what's really going on inside that organization because something comes at you like the 7,000 series rail cars, you know, all having to be taken offline because of a problem with their um, wheel set. So it's just really hard to know what's going on inside the organization. But publicly, you know, I think there's been a lot of really positive steps under the new uh, leadership and some new energy uh, and a board that seems to be taking their responsibility um, more seriously, which is really important because Metro, as you and I have discussed before, is not a state agency of Maryland. It's not a state agency of Virginia or a DC agency. It's not even a federal agency. It's the product of this interstate compact. And although we can provide some oversight from where you and I sit, Senator, um, it's really the board members that are supposed to provide the day-to-day -day oversight and controls uh, over it. And so having a board that's active and paying attention, I think is really important because they're really the, the front lines for that oversight. We act almost as gap fillers, but they're really the ones, you know, month in and month out who are supposed to be doing uh, that work. Unlike, for example, the Maryland Transit Administration, that is something that mm -hmm. you and I are supposed to be sort of the primary uh, level of oversight on. So one of the key um, uh, keys to, to Metro's success um, and improvement is funding. And you and Senator Feldman uh, worked together a bunch of years ago to do guaranteed funding for multiple years. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, so Metro, again, product of an interstate compact. Um, so unlike most transit systems, it has not had what's called dedicated funding. So in a lot of places, for example, they'll take a piece of the local sales tax or the state sales tax and give it directly to the transit agency. There might be a property tax. Whatever it is, there are different taxes that are dedicated uh, to the system. Metro hasn't had that. Metro usually has to go kind of hat in hand for both its operating and its capital budget to the different jurisdictions, including the federal government uh, on the capital side. Um, you know, about this has been a long time issue. I mean, this is a problem from the creation of Metro uh, and the Metro Compact um, 52 or 53 years ago. Um, but one of the things we were able to do a few years ago is working closely with Metro and a lot of regional stakeholders, we were able to articulate what are some of the sort of the most immediate capital needs that Metro has and what's it going to cost to deal with those capital needs. And so um, we and just were able to, to be work clear. Sorry, capital is the long-term investment, the structural stuff, as opposed to paying the salaries of the workers or right. yeah, no, this isn't the electric bill. It's not the salary of the of the station manager or the or the bus operator or the mechanic, right? right. It's, um, it's the longer term investments like making sure uh, that there's not water seeping into the red line between my stop and your stop. Uh, which has been a big problem uh, historically, and making sure that track ties are replaced on the on the outdoor uh, segments and things like that. And so um, we were able to work with our our partners in the region to articulate sort of what the uh, the they said cut the medium term capital need was, and came up with this uh, dedicated funding. We didn't do it as a specific tax the way they've done it in other places. We we did it a little differently. We said what's the total need. And then each jurisdiction will be responsible for coming up with the money for that need, but it will be guaranteed. And so in the case of Maryland, that was $167 million on top of what we're already doing. I mean, Maryland was already, you know, uh, contributing hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't want to give the impression that Maryland taxpayers were not already helping. They were, but this was to deal with some of the median, uh, medium capital needs. Uh, of course, the longer term capital needs are still on the table, uh, including, um, you know, improving some of the existing service, but also if you want to extend the service, as people are always talking about, those are some major needs. And then there are operating challenges uh, as well. Right. So um, I want to move on from Metro, but I do want to ask because the Silver Line in Virginia just got opened and extends to Dulles. Um, is that is that reasonable? And what should we be hoping for down the road as an extension of the lines in Maryland? Yeah. Is that well, I, mean, yeah I mean, the Silver Line, I mean, I think it's exciting. I think it's, you know, I think it's a net plus for the region. I mean, the odds of me ever taking uh, the Metro from Bethesda to, to Dulles, in my case, because I have other options, are pretty unlikely. I took it with my kids and my wife for fun uh -huh. as like a forest thing to do, but it's not going to be super convenient for us. But overall, for the region, it's a huge net plus. That was actually mostly, you know, that wasn't built by Metro, but Metro's operating it. So right. in that case, it's mostly been funded by uh, federal taxpayer contributions and then the tolls on the Dulles toll road to build it and then given to Metro to operate. And of course, we all contribute to those operations. Um, you know, what are the future, you know, potential extensions? There's a lot of great ideas on the table. I mean, I know the, the sort of, you know, the two dreams for Maryland are extending service over the Wilson Bridge, uh, to National Harbor, which has been studied many times. And then, of course, we've often had uh, the idea of extending the red line from Shady Grove, you know, up north towards Frederick uh, mm -hmm. as well. I, I think those are much longer term 
yeah. um, visions. There's a lot more shorter term and medium term stuff that needs to be done. But um, but you know, a lot of a lot of our transit and, and other you know uh, transportation infrastructure, as you know, does require that really long term vision. Absolutely. So even though it's not going to happen tomorrow, it's good that it's sort of on people's radar and, and talked about. Absolutely. So let's pivot to transparency in government. You and I have passed a number of bills that have um, served to open up and add some sunshine to our departments and agencies and stuff. Why don't you talk about why that's important and what you're proud about that? Yeah, you know, for me, how I got into it, and you were already sort of ahead of this, uh, ahead of ahead of me on on these issues. But um, a few years ago, I had a number of activists and advocates in my district. Um, working on election law issues. And one of the things, uh, which of course is a passion of yours, um, but one of the things I noticed was it was just kind of hard to get information about what the State Board of Elections was doing. Yep. Uh, and uh, I just thought to myself, why don't they just live stream these meetings? And that one in particular, because every one of our counties has its own board of elections and elections officials who need to know what the state board is doing. And why should a Garrett County election official have to drive to Annapolis to keep an eye on you know, what the board is doing. And I know they would send the newsletter, but that's not the same as being able to access the meeting. And so for me, it started with, we should just live stream the, the board of elections meetings uh, as, uh, as you know, we did a couple of other things at that time. At that time, committee meetings were live streamed in the General Assembly. The Board of Public Works was live streaming. The Public Service Commission was live streaming. But most other things were not available to watch uh, online. And in fact, to figure out to figure out just briefly if this was a good idea or not, I decided to go to a board of elections meeting. Yeah. And I got there, and they said, you know, can we help you? And I said, I'm just here for the meeting. And they said, the meeting already happened. It they changed. It they changed the meeting. Exactly. Yeah, from two o'clock to one o'clock. Or yes, they had changed the meeting time, so I missed it, which was no big deal because I walked down the street from my Annapolis office. But had it just been available for live stream, it wouldn't have mattered because right. I wouldn't have had to go anywhere, and I could just still watch the video even right. though. I'm missed the meeting. So that's how I got into it. And of course, you and I have expanded it to many other kind of yes. boards and agencies of, of the state. So just to be clear, for, for folks who might be watching this down the road or not remembering sort of the crazy pre-pandemic uh, efforts to, to uh, have government function, they thought they were going to have to hire a videographer, buy video cameras, edit the footage. I mean, it was going to be this expensive thing. And now, obviously, we all know that it, oh, and they had to have microphones and you couldn't, you know, they were doing audio only and we couldn't tell whose voice it was. And anyway, life is different. It's it's the only silver lining, I think, after the pandemic. But yeah, uh, I mean, Zoom made it really easy. Now that they're in more, more of these board meetings, I don't know how many of them, I know you watch the state board meetings, but I watch a bunch of the other agencies that you and I have worked on sort of opening up this way. And some of them, they need a little work because a lot of them, they're hybrid. So the people who are on Zoom or Teams, very easy to identify them and hear them. Then there's often one camera in the larger conference room. Yes. Um, and so it, it needs a little bit of work, but definitely COVID showed, one, the importance of this because government was able to keep functioning in an open, uh, transparent way, even though the doors to the building physically couldn't be open. Right. Um, but two, that's just not nearly as hard as, as you know, when they were first talking to us about it and all the expense and difficulty and complication they thought was right. there. And then not complying. So there is a compliance board, which is also just, okay, let's move on. Um, I want to do something, uh, anyway, talk about the Kerwin Commission, the blueprint for our public schools, um, because you're on appropriations and stuff. Talk about how you think that's going. Montgomery County's public schools are, are a real gem for us and a real selling point for bringing business and nonprofits to settle in Montgomery County. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's a very long uh, explanation discussion, but I will just, um, you know, emphasize to people, most of what people hear about the blueprint is about cost. And that's important, obviously, how much we spend on something and making sure money is being spent responsibly. But what I like to emphasize with the blueprint, is it's not just the total cost, but it's what we're spending the money on. And the blueprint, you know, focused in on some key areas, pre-kindergarten, uh, devoting some of those resources to, to those most in need, like English as a second language learners, people from uh, uh, with special needs, people from uh, economically disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, supporting teachers more, increasing uh, teacher uh, compensation to try to draw more people and, and, and even more highly qualified people into the uh, profession. Uh, the pathways, the sort of uh, the ladder from pre-K all the way through, whether it's a certificate or a, or a, or a four-year higher ed degree, whatever it is, build the whole pathway uh, for people to follow. Uh, and then that last piece oversight to make sure the money is being spent 
um, responsibly. We're still in the early days of it. I mean, to be yes. honest with you, it's a, it's a long-term um, investment. It's a, it's a, it's a long-term ramp up. Each of the counties now has to put together, there's a statewide implementation plan. Each of the counties has to put in an implementation plan. We set up this new uh, accountability and implementation board, which is sort of a new way to make sure things are happening. It's chaired by, chaired Ed by. Yeah, yes. Ed Leggett, our former county executive. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's hard, obviously, because we all want the schools to be perfect. Now I have two young kids in the, in the school system. So of course I want them to be perfect now, but realistically, it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, and of course, like a lot of things, it was dealt uh, a blow by the, by the pandemic. We're dealing with, you know, obviously public schools were always challenging. There were always a lot of needs, but we still have that learning loss issue for yes. people who did not thrive in the uh, in the virtual environment so it's a it's an ongoing endeavor and another area of really important oversight for the general assembly to make sure that it's continuing to move the way it was envisioned during that deliberative process that created the blueprint yes and a top priority for the moore miller administration so i want to get to them for a second but uh talk about there's going to be a new budget process this year why don't you give the um the insight in just plain language as to why people should care that the budget is going to be crafted differently this year for the very first time in our history. Yeah, I, so Maryland until um, until now uh, has been uh, the only state where the legislature could not add money. We could cut money from the governor's request. But we could not add money. There were some tricks around that that you know those of us who have been here a while have learned, but it was very complicated and frankly counterintuitive to most people who I think this the budget process for the state of Maryland should work like it does in almost every city, town, county, and state uh, in the country, if not the world. Right. Um, which is that the legislative body can move money around. We can cut from program A and add it to program B. So the new process now, the governor will still set the overall what we call the allowance, the overall total of what the budget will look like. But the legislature, you know, with you know, you need no individual can do it. It has to be by you know the, the through the majority process. Uh, we'll be able to move money around to different uh, to different programs and to different things. And so I, it's just a more sensible way to do it, to be honest with you. I think most people just were sort of dumbfounded that that wasn't the case before. In fact, I remember when I first learned about this restriction long before I was in office, Delegate Dumay, now Judge Dumay, was speaking at some event. And I could not believe it as a Hill person that yes. that could possibly be the case. But she explained very patiently and slowly to me that, yes, it was true. Maryland was the only state with this restriction, thanks to a, a statewide constitutional amendment, so a ballot question that the people voted for, we, we've now come to a kind of a more sensible place. Let me ask a cynical question for folks wondering at home. Uh-oh, legislators can add money to the budget. What is that gonna do to the whole budget? And isn't that gonna just explode everything and my taxes are gonna go through the roof and it's irresponsible. Why don't you talk about the uh, the guardrails just briefly again? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the key one is uh, that I said a minute ago, which is the overall total yes. change. But uh, I think one of the specific guardrails, I think you might've had it on the Senate floor this week, we're gonna have it on the House floor is, you know, we're putting some rules in place to how you're actually gonna, you know, deal with these new constitutional provisions. And one of them is, it's very explicit, which makes sense if you can't increase the total uh, value of the budget. If you're going to increase funding to program A, you have to decrease funding for program B. And so yep. I obviously would love to fund Metro Rail at a much higher number, but I can't just come in there and say, you know, yep. increase Metro Rail funding by $100 million. I need to identify $100 million worth of cuts elsewhere. Well, right. good luck getting my colleagues to go along right. with that. <laughs> uh, yep. So it's not going to be quite as uh, Wild West as maybe some people are. Uh, yeah. imagining because we do have to have a balanced budget every year. We don't have our own central bank. We don't have our own printing presses. You know, we operate a little bit differently than what people see on cable news. I thought you also might mention the Spending Affordability Commission Committee. We do. Yeah. So we have a process in Maryland called Spending Affordability. It's a joint House and Senate process that um, sets. It's, it's actually the equivalent of what they're supposed to do on Capitol Hill with their budget committees, like a budget resolution every year where we say, you know, what's the overall uh, size of the budget going to be? What fund balance do we want at the end? How much money do we want left in the bank account after we do all of our spending on health care and public safety and education at the end of the year? What should the size of the state workforce be? What should the size of our construction budget be? Uh, a few other issues like that that set sort of the broad guidelines. And uh, it's not a perfect process, but it is one that the bond rating agencies, which you know have value we may not want to get into here, but you know are a useful sort of third-party check on our processes, they really value and say, this shows a, a level of kind of 
fiscally responsible um, budgeting that that uh, that they appreciate. Yes. So just uh, to close that out, Maryland has been one of the very small number of uh, AAA uh, bond rated states, and that's the very best. And that means we can borrow money at a more affordable rate for our long term capital investment projects. Um, uh, you have just been named majority leader by Speaker Adrian Jones. Uh, talk about how that changes um, your responsibilities. Uh, well, it's a great honor, and I'm, you know, I'm, I was flattered to even sort of considered for it, let alone actually be uh, doing it. Um, my predecessor, uh, our friend Delegate Lukey, former Delegate Lukey from Montgomery County, his uh, top piece of advice for me was that I actually now need to uh, pay attention all the time on the House floor. I can just never, like go get that cup of coffee in the back or or tune out for even a second to respond to a constituent email. Uh, that was that was sort of the biggest thing is I just need to be sort of attentive all the time on the House floor. But, it, you know, it's great. Look, we're very lucky. We have a very strong uh, Democratic majority, um, which is great for the agenda we're hoping to pass with the more Miller administration and our partners uh, in the Senate. And, uh, you know, in addition to kind of the process on the floor and, and floor debate and all those things that are very public that the majority leader uh, does, I'm also just trying to get around to make sure all the new members are kind of uh, um, you know, doing as well as they can in their in their new jobs and and uh, position to thrive for themselves and then also their constituents because they're here to represent you know their districts and we want to make sure they're uh, you know getting what they need to in place with their staff with the bills they want to request understanding how things uh, operate around here so that's been fun to get to know uh, even more of the members from around the state than I than I did before. That's wonderful. Um, so talk uh, briefly, we have all these new um, statewide elected officials. We have Westmore and Aruna Miller coming in as our governor and lieutenant governor. Brooke Learman, our friend and former House colleague, uh, Delegate Learman is gonna be our new state comptroller. And then, um, and then we also have former delegate Derek Davis uh, as our state treasurer, who's medium new, and then our new attorney general, Anthony Brown, also uh, a former delegate and uh, with whom I've served. Talk about how you anticipate serving with some of these folks. Yeah, well, it sounds like Westmore missed a big chance to serve in the House of Delegates. That seems like somehow he was able to skip that and still get to one of these <laughs> high offices. But uh, no, it's really exciting. Look, I've only been here, I'm, I'm starting my third term. So I've personally only been here under a Republican governor. I know you did a, a tour of duty under, you know, before Governor Hogan, before you were in the yes. state Senate. So I don't actually quite know what it's going to be like. But what I'm what I'm optimistic for is to have governing partners instead of sparring partners, which is kind of what we've had for the past okay. eight yeah. years. And you know, on a lot of things that we worked on, they didn't necessarily, they weren't necessarily partisan issues, but the second floor, as we call it, where the governor's offices are, was very disconnected from the work we do. And I don't just mean not testifying, but not even offering kind of some of their subject matter and technical yes. expertise that, you know, even though I think we did a lot of great things during those eight years, I think could have improved the work product even more. Uh, and it'll just be great to have, you know, partners in that work instead of, um, you know, people that were just sort of butting heads with. Amen, I agree. Uh, so I still have a million more questions for you, but I, let's pivot to personal. Uh, uh, let's start with the fact that you are a voracious reader and you also watch a million movies. I do not know how you have time for this. That was before the majority of your appointments. So I'm not <laughs> sure that might be coming to a halt. All right. Um, yeah, literally, how do you make time in your life? And we're going to get to your family in a moment. Uh, so, so it's a given that you spend a ton of time and are a magnificent father, or so it seems. Uh, but how do you make time to, to read? Or is it literally between 3 and 4 a.m.? Yeah, so you'll have to invite my wife on as a guest to find out if I'm actually a fabulous father. But um, I would say that um, there's this former Admiral James uh, Stavridis, who's kind of a, a little bit of an idol of mine on, on reading. And he has this great advice in this book he has called The Leader's Bookshelf, where he basically says, you just can't wait for that sort of magic, perfect time to read where you you know have three hours and you can sit in front of the fire with your glass of Merlot or whatever. You just need to read in short bursts when you have the opportunity. And that's kind of how I do it. And so those metro rides really to and from work when I'm working at my other job, that's yeah. really the key time, just being able to read for those 15 minutes uh, back and forth and you know other times like that. And uh, it's even the same with movies. I very rarely, except on a Saturday night, do I get to watch uh, the first minute of a movie to the last minute of a movie. I just break uh, it up when I have uh, when I have time. Wow. So that's the secret. And do, how? Uh, what's your division of books on paper that are actual books versus Kindles? 
Uh, I now only read on paper. I tried the Kindle thing for a while, or actually I did it on an iPad and it just, I didn't take to it the same way and I didn't feel like I was retaining. I don't retain enough of the books as it is, but I was retaining even less reading off the screen. I have enough time in front of screens, you know. And do you write in your books? Do you highlight or make notes or is they, are they pristine? I often will dog ear pages or if it's an older book, I'll put a post-it in. And then as you know, I write little reviews of them on Facebook, yes, which again, it's just a trick to remember more of the information. It's not, to, it's not for any other reason. Uh, and so that the, the, the dog ears or the post-its are how I know what I want to sort of say in that little review. So Love it. Love it. All right. So shifting to your beautiful family, you met Rebecca on a birthright trip to Israel. Uh, did it take right away? And now you've got two kids and you're teaching them and exposing them to politics, policy and community engagement. Just yeah. talk about your family time. Uh, so Rebecca and I were both on a, a Hill staff birthright trip to Israel, which was great because we got to do a lot of very government oriented things. And instead of having um, five soldiers on our bus, as most birthright trips do, we had five Knesset staffers and we were all nice. staffers, so it was a really Love great. Uh, the Israeli thing. parliament is the yeah. Knesset. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. And, um, uh, you know, even though it, on one end it took right away, um, my now wife didn't talk to me for about nine months after that. So it took a little time. Uh, but um, yeah, we were married in 2008 and uh, we have Harrison, who's now uh, 11, uh, and Abby was born a few years later. She is now uh, six. Fantastic. And how do you do work life balance? A lot of people only ask uh, women about that, but this is critically important to you and you engage with them in a real way. Yeah, uh, I go home most nights when we're in Annapolis. I think that's one secret, which, you know, frankly, it's in some ways just a luxury of my committee assignment. That's not, every committee is not conducive to that. Uh, and I try to wake up with them uh, every morning. Uh, and so that's a lot of the time we're together is at night and in the morning. And then, you know, on the weekends between the political obligations you and I both have, you know, try to spend, you know, significant amount of time doing things with them. But, you know, um, what I found as I've uh, gotten comfortable in middle age here is that a lot of my life is spent waiting outside for my kids to come out of some activities. So, <laughs> that's a great time for reading, by the way, when you're waiting for your daughter to come out of gymnastics on Saturday morning or both kids to come out of religious school on Sunday. That's a great time to, to get, get a chapter in. That's perfect. Well, uh, we need to start wrapping up here. And so it is time to do our fast five, uh, five quick questions uh, to let people get to know you a little better. Although I, I think they've gotten to know you a little bit better from what we've already chatted about. Uh, but majority leader, delegate, Mark Corman. Uh, question number one, what is the your favorite family vacation? What's the family favorite trip you've ever taken? Um... I don't know if it's my favorite, but something we do most years is we uh, stay at one of the lock houses on the CNO Canal. I don't know if you've ever done this, but it's a really fun uh, activity. They've refurbished a lot of the lock houses along the CNO Canal to different eras. And so most years we've done that uh, once or twice. And um, uh, there's one up near Hagerstown we really like uh, where the canal's actually grown in there. It's grass inside the canal. So it's pretty cool. Very cool. Uh, and I know I'm as, about to ask you an impossible question. So I'm not going to ask you for your favorite movie of all time, but why don't you give me a few of your favorite movies of all time? Sure. Uh, uh, Rocky, which I'm now rediscovering with my son. He's gotten really uh, into them. Uh, I flip original back Rocky? Or original Rocky. Rocky, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I, mean, I like them all, but Rocky, the original one, is okay. uh, a much Adrian, better movie. Than people. Adrian! It's a much better movie than people remember if you actually go yeah. back and, and watch it. Uh, I flip back and forth between The Godfather and The Godfather Part Two, uh, Jaws, High Noon, Shawshank Redemption. I, not a lot of shockers on there, uh, pretty traditional uh, picks. A lot of boy movies, though, but okay. <laughs> I do love Shawshank. Um, if you had not gone into politics or law, what's an alternative career you might have considered? Well, like I said, I, you know, I went Hollywood. out to California to, to yes. try to be Steven Spielberg and I, you know, did my one film internship and, uh, and ended up here. So I probably not, probably that was not my destiny. We didn't get to talk about that internship. That's cool. Tell us a sentence or two about that. Uh, well, I worked for a production company, but the exciting thing was the guy I worked for, who's a guy named Brian Burke. Uh, after I worked for him, we, we worked on some maybe not great projects, but he ended up working very closely with J.J. Abrams on the Star Trek reboot movies from 12 years ago, the, the, the Star Wars continuation movies, like uh, Alias, all the stuff J.J. Abrams has done. Uh, this guy I worked for in the early 2000s has been uh, a part of. So uh, I missed all of that, but I I kind of I kind of get a kick out of it because he's been so uh, successful in that field. Nice. 
Question number four. You are so busy. You do so many things and are accountable to so many people in addition to your constituents. What do you do for yourself? What do you do for self-care that is off the grid, unrelated to your kids, your family? What do you do for Mark Corman? Uh, I mean, it's probably the reading. I think that's probably my, uh, you know, what I enjoy. Okay. And the last question. Preferably on a train ride. How about that? (laughs) Okay. All right. Um, The question that I ask everybody is, uh, Majority Leader Mark Corman, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is a skill or talent, something you're really good at, that most folks can't do? Uh, Well, I will tell you what Comptroller Francho once told me my superpower was, which he said my superpower was sarcasm. Uh, (laughs) And I think I've done a good job during this podcast of keeping it uh, suppressed. Yeah, uh, I do have, I would say, uh, I've been told I have quite a dry wit. So, uh, uh, so I'll go with that. I love that, actually. All right. I don't know if that's a compliment or not so much that from. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how he meant. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, Deli Corman, I am so proud of you. And I'm so. The state is so grateful that you are in leadership and that you are just such an effective delegate for your district and for the whole state of Maryland. So thank you for taking the time to kibitz today. Well, you're very kind, and it was great to kibitz with you, but it's really great working with you uh, outside of the podcast also. Appreciate it. All right. See you soon. Take, Take care.